Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Ain Dara Temple Footprints. Located northwest of Aleppo, Syria, Ain Dara is a small village and home to the magnificent Ain Dara Temple. In 1955, a huge basalt lion was found completely by accident, and then later excavations revealed it was part of a large temple. One of the most famous features are enormous footprints on the ground, meant to represent the footsteps of the gods. The Syro-Hittites, also known as the Neo-Hittites, were a political group that emerged toward the end of the second millennium BC, filling a power vacuum in the eastern Mediterranean that was left behind by the collapse of the Hittite Empire. They likely did not see themselves as different from their predecessors, but in hindsight the two groups were distinct. After rising to power, the Syro-Hittites became the dominant force in the region until the 8th century BC, when the Neo-Assyrian Empire conquered them. Built during the early Iron Age, the Ain Dara Temple was situated next to a courtyard made from sandstones and flagstones. The temple itself measured 100 feet by 100 feet and was once lined with basalt rocks bearing carvings of sphinxes and other mythical creatures. Now only their feet remain. One of the most interesting features is a set of three-foot-long footprints carved into the temple's stone floor, followed by two single footprints which are spaced roughly 30 feet apart, an appropriate distance for a giant or a god who would have stood 65 feet tall. While no one really thinks an actual giant god stepped into the temple, it is an extremely unique feature. The question is, why did the builders make these footprints? Some researchers believe that they are the iconic footprint of the deity that would be found inside as if to show the presence of the deity as they enter their chamber temple and cross the room. They leave quite the impression, even today. Long Yu Caves A group of farmers in China's Zhejiang province received the surprise of a lifetime in 1992 when they drained several small ponds in their village and discovered some enormous caves. It turned out to be an ancient underground world that nobody knew existed. All signs point toward the caves being carved out on purpose by some ancient civilization. But the question is, who were they? So far, 36 grottos have been discovered, including five enormous caverns, in total covering 30,000 square meters. The curious thing is that none of them are connected. They were carved into solid siltstone, with pillars evenly distributed throughout to support the ceiling and walls. Every stone column and wall is uniformly decorated with chisel marks, creating parallel lines. The marks make everything look like a pattern which would have taken a very long time, especially in the dark. There are also stone carvings of animals like horses, fish, and birds. The structures collect rainwater runoff from ground level and are equipped with sophisticated drainage systems for managing excess water. Based on the sheer size of the caves, scientists estimate that it would have taken 1,000 people working day and night for six years to complete. It probably took much longer than that, but so far there is no evidence of tools or construction methods. The large scale of the caves and the architectural design and attention to detail indicate that they were made by a very advanced society. But ever since their discovery, archaeologists, scientists, and historians have been unable to determine who built the Long Yu Caves, why they were built, and what they were for. The only known historical record mentioning the caves is a 17th century poem, which doesn't really reveal much. Clay pots discovered on the cavern's floors were dated to sometime between 206 BC and 23 AD, suggesting that the caves are at least 2,000 years old. Perhaps the caves were tombs, storage facilities of some kind, barracks for soldiers, or perhaps it was used for some type of mining. Only one of these caves is open to tourists so far, and despite years of research, the civilization responsible remains unexplained. Baby Buried in a Jar Late last year, archaeologists in Jaffa, Israel, discovered the skeleton of a human baby inside a 3,800-year-old jar. Archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority unearthed the poorly preserved remains from a shallow pit roughly 10 feet below sea level, while performing routine excavations of a 4,000-year-old city ahead of a construction project. Jar burials are fairly common, dating as far back as 4,500 BC and up to the 20th century. Different civilizations customize the practice according to their beliefs. Despite the practice's long history, scholars are unsure what its purpose was. It was once customary only to bury adults in jars, but at some point people began burying babies and children in them. IAA archaeologist Yoav Arbel speculated that perhaps ancient people were compelled to protect their dead from the environment, or the jar was meant to be symbolic, representing the return to the womb, perhaps both. 
Scientists are hoping that excavations at this site and others will help us understand more about the rituals and context of these jar burials. First, identical twins. An upper Paleolithic burial site in modern-day Austria contains the oldest known remains of identical human twins. Dating back roughly 31,000 years, the Stone Age grave was discovered in 2005 at the krems Wattberg archaeological site, which sits along the banks of the Danube River. It contains the skeletons of an infant who died shortly after childbirth and their sibling, who survived for around seven weeks before passing away. Over the years, this site has revealed over 2,300 stone artifacts and many, many mammoth remains, including heads and teeth. However, the recent discovery of twins found underneath a mammoth shoulder blade has made major headlines. Their remains were covered with red ochre pigment, and the double burial contained 53 mammoth ivory beads, which were once probably a necklace, as well as a fox tooth and three mollusks, which were probably necklace pendants. The mammoth shoulder blade was placed on top of them, probably as part of a ritual. DNA analysis confirmed that the two siblings buried together are identical twins. These twins predate the twin girls found in Spain dating back to the 4th century BC and provide answers to some important developmental and evolutionary questions. DNA also proved that an infant buried nearby was most likely the twin's cousin, who died at just three months old. The child was buried in an adjacent plot just five feet away and was covered in red ochre and accompanied by grave goods, including a three-inch long mammoth ivory pin. It is the first time researchers have used ancient DNA to confirm twins in the archaeological record. The archaeologists working on this said that finding multiple burials from the Paleolithic period is already rare, but the fact that there was enough high-quality DNA still available to analyze was like winning the lottery. Aksumite Empire Considered one of the least documented civilizations of the ancient world, the Aksumite Empire was an African kingdom that spanned modern-day Eritrea and northern Ethiopia, as well as parts of Djibouti, Somalia, and Somaliland. It rose to power around 80 AD and lasted for many centuries, meeting its downfall in 825. The kingdom of Aksum was a major player along a commercial trade route between the Roman Empire and ancient India. It had its own currency for trading and participated in the politics of kingdoms across the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. Aksum was the first sub-Saharan empire to mint its own coins and adopt Christianity, but researchers know very little else about it. Outside of Egypt and Sudan, it's the earliest complex society or major civilization in Africa, archaeologist Michael Harrower told the New Scientist. Aksum stopped producing coins in the early 7th century. Meanwhile, residents were forced inland for safety, where they sought refuge from some sort of upheaval on higher ground. The capital was abandoned and resettled at a yet unknown location. One theory suggests that the Aksum Empire became economically isolated as other civilizations dominated the Red Sea, naturally leading to its decline. On the other hand, legend holds that a Jewish queen named Yodit ordered the burning of Aksum's Christian churches around 960, but several modern historians doubt that she ever even existed. Another hypothesis suggests that a pagan queen named Bani al-Hanwiya from a rivaling tribe ended Aksumite power. Climate change is also cited as a possible triggering factor for the Kingdom of Aksum's collapse. During the first century, increased rains vastly improved the region's food supply and lengthened the annual growing season. But food production had to support a large population, and it's possible that the land simply could not endure the intensity of cultivation that the culture required, and that soil erosion ultimately led to the Aksumite Empire's downfall. In late 2019, archaeologists announced the discovery of Beta Samati, a lost Aksum city located between its capital, also named Aksum, and the Red Sea, thanks to locals tipping them off about the buried site, which sits over 10 feet below ground. Experts hope that the settlement will help them learn more about the enigmatic empire and its decline, which began during the mid-6th century. Neptune Storm Reversal A year after spotting a dark storm on Neptune in 2018, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope captured the vortex abruptly reversing. These storms typically vanish or fade after a few years, but this one behaved much differently, stopping in its tracks while traveling south and making a U-turn, moving back northward. Researchers discovered a smaller dark spot on the planet, which they believe may be a cousin storm that branched off of the larger formation. This was the first time scientists observed the process of a dark spot being disrupted, making the discovery an exciting one. These storms are high-pressure systems that rotate clockwise. 
Measuring 4,600 miles across, the current storm is larger than the Atlantic Ocean and the fourth darkest spot that the Hubble has detected since 1993. It did not travel toward Neptune's equator, as these storms usually do before they break up. The smaller storm that scientists believe broke off measures 3,900 miles across. It was really exciting to see this one act how it was supposed to act, and then all of a sudden it just stops and swings back, Michael H. Wong of the University of California at Berkeley said in a NASA statement. While Neptune's storms are largely a mystery, the ongoing one is the most closely studied so far, and scientists are gleaning more information than ever before about these strange weather systems. Squatting Skeleton In May of last year, archaeologists were performing a routine excavation prior to wind turbine construction in the German state of Brandenburg. Here they were surprised to discover a strange squatting skeleton belonging to a woman who died over 4,000 years ago. The pit was found near an ancient settlement area. She was found lying on her right side with her head pointing eastward, according to Dr. Christoph Krauskopf of the Brandenburg Authorities for Heritage Management and Archaeological State Museum. This type of grave is known as a contracted burial in the archaeological world. This crouching or squatting position is one of the oldest forms of positioning a body and typical of burials in Neolithic Europe. However, Krauskopf says that the burial is quite strange because the pit is much larger than what was needed for the woman's remains and there are no grave goods that might help indicate her status or cause of death. However, someone had taken the time to border the area with field stones. Experts estimated that the burial dates back to sometime between 2500 and 2200 BC, during the final phase of the Neolithic period. The bones and teeth will undergo radiocarbon dating, genetic testing, and isotope analysis, which will hopefully reveal the skeleton's age and the environment she lived in. Skeleton Lake Located at Rupkund Lake deep within the Himalayas, a site dubbed Skeleton Lake has perplexed experts since its discovery in 1942 by a British guide. Here, at 16,499 feet above sea level, lie hundreds of human skeletons. At first, people thought it was the remains of soldiers who had died crossing the Himalayas during the war, but they seemed like they had been there much longer than that. It looked more like the people here had died due to some catastrophic event, perhaps an epidemic or a storm. But what really happened has been a long-standing mystery. An international team of researchers published a recent study which analyzed the bone's DNA. It was tough work seeing as the site is often visited by pilgrims and hikers who move the skeletons and remove artifacts. There are also rock slides and other natural events that have damaged things over the years. Local legend says that a king and queen along with their court were making a pilgrimage to the shrine of a mountain goddess but they were acting disrespectfully, getting drunk and celebrating a bit too much, so they were struck down by the goddess. To solve the mystery, the scientists sequenced the genomes of 38 of the skeletons and were surprised to learn that while 23 were of South Asian ancestry and one was of Southeast Asian ancestry, 14 were from the Eastern Mediterranean. These people were not all one group that had died all at the same time, but were actually several groups of people over many years. The Asian remains trace back to around 800 BC and the others to 1800 BC. This finding directly challenges the long-held theory that everyone at Rupkun Lake died in a single catastrophic event. Rupkun Lake attracted visitors from far-flung places, but they were unable to determine what brought people there or how they died. One thing is clear, the site's history is far more complex than scientists originally imagined, and they are hoping they can continue to find answers to the mysterious site. Life Beneath the Ice Earlier this year, scientists from the British Antarctic Survey announced the discovery of a tiny, mysterious life form a half mile beneath the ice of the Filcher Ron Ice Shelf on the southeastern Weddell Sea. In such an inhospitable environment, where pressure increases and temperature drops the further down you go, researchers naturally expected the presence of life to diminish. The survey team drilled nearly 3,000 feet into the ice and found what they believe may be an entirely new species clinging to a rock in the complete darkness. 162 miles from the open ocean. Although past studies have found various life forms this far beneath the ice, including fish, worms, jellyfish, and krill, this is the first time researchers have discovered filter feeding organisms at that depth. It appears to go against all previous theories of what types of life could survive, the researcher said in a press release. Biogeographer and lead study author Dr. Hu Griffiths expressed his surprise. 
Updating our discovery raises so many more questions than it answers, such as how did they get there? What are they eating? How long have they been there? Are these the same species as we see outside the ice shelf, or are they new species? And what would happen to these communities if the ice shelf collapsed? Scientists have only explored a tennis court-sized portion of the ice shelves in the Southern Ocean, which occupy a total of nearly 580,000 square miles. All things considered, there may be even more fascinating discoveries waiting to be made. The Cucuteni Tripilians the Neolithic Kukuteni Tripilian culture, also known as the Tripoli culture, existed in what is now Eastern Europe, encompassing parts of modern-day Moldova, Ukraine, and Russia. It rose to prominence around 5,500 BC and lasted until 2,750 BC. The civilization's settlements were small and dense. Sometime between 4,000 and 3,500 BC, the Kukuteni Tripilia civilization built Neolithic Europe's largest settlements, with populations numbering between 20,000 and 46,000 people. Evidence shows that the culture had a habit of destroying its settlements every 60 to 80 years by burning them down, for reasons that scientists still don't understand. Oftentimes, they built new settlements on top of the burned-down remains of past ones, for example, the Poduri site in Romania bears evidence of 13 habitation levels throughout its existence. The Cucuteni Tripilians also left behind no signs of a written language. Between this and the seemingly ritual burning of their cities, experts have very little to work with in terms of learning about the culture. The few clues left behind include clay totems, copper tools, and spiritual treasures. Rediscovered during the late 19th century, evidence of the civilization shows that Neolithic Eastern Europe played a bigger role in human advancement than it was previously credited for, but the lingering question of what and how it contributed remain. A Medieval Female Criminal In 2017, archaeologists working in southern Bulgaria discovered a late medieval grave containing a woman who was buried face down with her hands tied behind her back. Found in a necropolis on the Nebet Tepe Hill in the modern-day city of Plovdiv, the odd burial could have belonged to a bandit or some other sort of criminal, whose strange position was likely a punishment for an alleged wrongdoing she committed while she was alive. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to restore that funeral's history completely because there are also pits from the Ottoman period there, explained excavation leader and archaeologist Sofia Hristeva, who added that it was the first time she had found someone buried in such a manner. The site itself dates back to the 13th and or 14th centuries during the Second Bulgarian Empire. Also in 2017, archaeologists discovered an equally strange skeleton with an arrow through its chest at the nearby site of Antiquity Odeon, which the ancient Greeks and Romans once used for theatrical performances before it was repurposed as a medieval cemetery. Dating back to the 11th or 12th century, the grave left experts with numerous unanswered questions, including whether the arrow killed the deceased individual, or if it was left there as a gift for a warrior. Yellow Penguin While snapping pictures on a remote island in the South Georgia Islands in the Southern Atlantic Ocean, Elgin photographer Eve Adams captured a photo of an extremely rare yellow king penguin. I'd never seen or heard of a yellow penguin before, he told Kennedy News and Media, adding there were about 120,000 birds on the beach, and this was the only yellow one there. Like their relative, the emperor penguin, king penguins typically bear the black and white tuxedo look with a dab of yellow on their collar. Oddly, the yellow penguin retained this pigment, but appears to have lost its darker feathers. According to the Australian Antarctic Program, unusual plumage is rare among penguins, and it's difficult for scientists to determine the causes of these anomalies. In many cases, genetic mutations are responsible, although other factors such as disease, diet, or injury can play a role. Adams stated that the yellow penguin has leucism, a genetic condition marked by the loss of some, but not all, of an animal's melanin. Conservation biologist D. Boresma agreed with this assessment. Unlike true albinos, leucistic creatures have not completely lost all their pigment. But not all experts feel this way. Behavioral ecologist Kevin McGraw, who did not participate in the expedition, said that he doesn't believe the penguin is leucistic, because it appears to have lost all its melanin, even if it does not have the same white hue as a typical albino, a potato-potato. But he conceded, scientists would need to gather plumage samples from the animal and test them to know for sure. One thing all the experts seem to agree on is that they've never seen a penguin quite like it, and they can't tell just by looking at the bird what causes its unusual coloration. Ancestral Puebloans 
A group of Native Americans called the Anasazi, now referred to as the Ancestral Puebloans, once lived in an area of the U.S. that is famously known today as the Four Corners. Their network of hundreds of communities spanned across modern-day southeastern Utah, northeastern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, and southwestern Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans possessed an advanced knowledge of the skies and incorporated the celestial sciences into their diverse architecture. They are best known for their famous cliff dwellings, which were primarily used for defensive purposes. Built between 900 and 1350 AD, these multi-story homes were incorporated into tall, steep mesas and canyon walls like large apartment complexes. Some of these structures can still be seen today in places like the Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico and Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans also built small pit houses out of earth and stone, as well as huge complexes of hundreds of rooms known as Great Houses. Additionally, they were well known for their pottery, which was generally gray in color. They are also well known for their kivas, a circular space used for ceremonial purposes. During the 12th and 13th centuries, they left their homes, and historians have not figured out why. Researchers believe that climate change, such as prolonged drought, topsoil erosion, deforestation, and other environmental factors may have triggered the decision to migrate elsewhere. But they can't say with certainty that this was the case. They can only speculate based on the available evidence. Ur Skeleton during the summer of 2015, scientists at the Penn Museum in Philadelphia rediscovered a 6,500-year-old human skeleton that had sat in a coffin-like box in a storage room for 85 years. There was no documentation of its identity, leaving the skeleton's origins and life story a mystery. Further examination and a project focused on digitizing records from a past archaeological excavation helped to shed some light on the skeleton in storage. As it turns out, the bones belonged to a muscular male who stood between 5.7 and 5.8 feet tall. He died at age 50 or older and was buried at the site of Ur in what is now southern Iraq. Ubayid period skeletons dating back between 5,500 BC and 4,000 BC are extremely rare. A team led by Sir Leonard Woolley unearthed the remains between 1929 and 1930 while excavating a Mesopotamian royal cemetery at the site. This particular skeleton predates the other remains by roughly 2,000 years. During ancient times, Ur was a small island surrounded by a marsh, according to Woolley's findings. At some point, a great flood supposedly gushed in without notice. Based on where they were buried, it's believed that the skeleton lived around this time. Shortly after news broke of the rediscovery, experts expressed their hopes to learn more about the individual and the society they lived in, including their diet and ancestral origins, by analyzing the skeleton using modern techniques. The Mycenaeans The Mycenaeans were immigrants who arrived in the Aegean region around 2000 BC. While their origins are a bit murky, they subsequently conquered the Minoans after living alongside them and trading with them for some time. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans were the first literate societies in Europe and greatly influenced the classical Greeks. The Mycenaeans took over the Minoan area and were more militaristic and austere than they were. They became the dominant civilization in the area, building palace fortresses and tombs, large walls and gates. They frequently terrorized and raided other societies like the Hittites and the Egyptians. Through their plundering, they became extremely wealthy, and the civilization flourished between 1600 and 1200 BC. There were over 100 centers spread throughout Greece and the Mediterranean, but historians still don't know how they were organized how they communicated, and what the relationship was between all of the different palaces and their populations. Then suddenly, the civilization began to decline. Around 1230 BC, people began leaving the region in droves. Some historians say that we may never know why the Mycenaeans disappeared. There are numerous theories, including the realistic possibility that the society's violence against others finally caught up with them. Natural disasters, possibly including an earthquake and or a volcanic eruption, may have also caused their decline. By 1100 BC, most majestic sites had been reduced to villages, but their legacy remains. Giant Footprint of Pingyan In late 2016, photographs of a giant human-shaped footprint that a group of photographers supposedly discovered in the province of Gizhou in southwestern China circulated on social media. Numerous websites reportedly claimed that the footprint was real, despite its unrealistically gargantuan proportions, measuring 22.4 inches long, 7.9 inches wide, and 1.2 inches deep. 
The measurements might vary, but it's multiple times larger than the average human male's foot, which measures about 10 inches long. It was reportedly found fossilized in rock and dated back to 200 million years ago, long before humans or our ancestors walked the Earth. It has come to be known as the Pingyan footprint and is propagating the many myths and stories about giants that once roamed the Earth. Almost all ancient cultures tell tales of giants, but they are mostly just that, stories. However, this footprint is questionable. Is it real or man-made? A footprint found in Bolivia turned out to be from a large carnivorous dinosaur rather than that of a giant. Other footprints found in Africa also have questionable origins. The fact-checking site Snopes failed to turn up any articles in the local Gizu newspapers or any other reliable sources from the time the footprint was discovered. Moreover, its provenance was never proven. Many have denounced Michael Tellinger, the so-called archaeologist who supposedly discovered the Pingyan footprint, as a conspiracy theorist so many do not take him seriously. As of now, it remains unexplained. Bizarre Burials Swiss anthropologist Amélie Alteraj was perplexed when someone found a middle-aged man buried face down at a 400-year-old cemetery in Bern. He was laid to rest with an iron knife and a purse full of coins dating back between 1630 and 1650 AD in the crook of his arm. Alteraj wrote in a research paper that she suspected the man was buried face down to prevent him from returning from the grave. She worked with a team of researchers to analyze nearly 100 face-down burials that took place over a 900-year period throughout Switzerland, most dated back to tumultuous times when plagues ravaged the region and the burials revealed signs of mutilation or weighing bodies down with stones. Experts believe that these methods were designed to thwart vampires and the undead by preventing them from escaping their graves. As the plague swept across Europe starting in 1347 AD, burial practices shifted noticeably, demonstrating a widespread belief that the dead could return to haunt the living. The deadly disease killed people by the millions, and it claimed lives faster than communities could keep up with. Consequently, people dealt with the unpleasant reality of decaying corpses, which bloat and shift, making disturbing sounds that may make them seem like zombies or some other type of creature that may return to life. The belief that people were cursed from beyond the grave spread as individuals became ill and died within days of a relative's funeral. But not all researchers believe that face-down burials stemmed from a fear of the undead. Speaking with National Geographic, archaeologist Peter Parvanov explained that people may have been laid to rest in this position in a desperate attempt to prevent disease spread or to represent sin, based on the belief that God was punishing a community for their wrongdoings through disease. The Rapa Nui Hundreds of years ago, a small group of Polynesians left their homeland for unknown reasons and rowed their vessels through the Pacific Ocean. They eventually settled on a remote island known today as Easter Island, located roughly 2,182 miles off the modern-day Chilean coast. Found uninhabited, this small 63-square-mile island boasted lush greenery and rolling hills. The settlers named it Rapa Nui. There, they built massive monolithic structures called Moai also known as the Easter Island Head, some of these mysterious sculptures still stand today. The more archaeologists and researchers learn, the more intriguing Easter Island becomes. The immense stone figures are a testament to the society's artistry and engineering. Scientists can't seem to agree on exactly when the Rapa Nui people arrived on the island. It was previously believed that they came between 700 and 800 AD, but a radiocarbon analysis shows that they may have arrived as late as 1200. Others think that the Rapa Nui came to the island much sooner, perhaps as early as 300 AD. Some question how they were able to plot their course to get to the island in the first place. Researchers also struggle to understand why the civilization collapsed. Perhaps they ran out of food. It looks like at some point, deforestation and agriculture caused palm trees and grass to dwindle, leaving behind eroded, nutrient-deprived soil that became practically impossible to cultivate. The island was practically barren by the time the Dutch arrived in 1722. One theory holds that the Rapa Nui civilization consisted of several tribes throughout the island, and that these factions began warring against one another when food became scarce and the threat of starvation loomed. Another hypothesis, based on findings indicating that the Rapa Nui may have arrived around 1200, suggests that the environmental destruction they suffered from happened extremely fast. Rat bones found at an ancient settlement site point toward the possibility that this invasive species contributed to the society's swift downfall. 
Archaeologist Terry Hunt does not believe that humans could have destroyed the island's forest so quickly on their own, and that the rodents fed on the once abundant plant life until there was practically nothing left. Planet 9 In recent years, scientists began to wonder if there is possibly a ninth unknown planet in our solar system, yet they haven't been able to find it. Believe it or not, experts' understanding of the outer solar system is relatively new, having made most discoveries beyond Neptune after 1992. But they have found thousands of space objects since then, making it hard to understand why, if there is a ninth planet orbiting the Sun much further away than Neptune and Uranus, nobody has spotted it yet. Researchers formed the theory of a Planet 9 in 2015 based solely on mathematical calculations, speculating that the Neptune-sized planet travels a highly elongated orbit. If scientists' numbers are correct, this mysterious planet may have 10 times more mass than the Sun and may travel 20 times further from the Sun than Neptune. For now, experts are working diligently to figure out a way to determine for sure if there is a ninth planet. Last year, a team of scientists from Harvard University theorized that by studying black holes in the outer solar system, they will be able to determine whether there is a distant planet orbiting the Sun or if the unknown object is actually a black hole. They will rely on data gleaned from Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time, a 10-year survey of the sky slated to launch in 2022, meaning any definitive answers will probably not come anytime soon. Six-Headed Chief In the 14th century, a warrior in his 40s died and was buried in Scotland's Easter Ross region in what is now the fishing village of Port Mahomek. He was laid to rest in a ceremonial fashion with an array of other human remains surrounding his head. Someone discovered the burial in 1997, and the deceased man was soon nicknamed the Six-Headed Clan Chief due to the confusing mix of human bones that were found with him. Originally, scientists believed that the medieval grave contained the remains of a single man surrounded by five skulls. Last year, DNA analysis results revealed that the burial was occupied by two men and surrounded by four skulls. Still creepy and mysterious. Why did they do this? The men were either cousins or a nephew and uncle and were buried between the late 13th and early 15th centuries. Three of the four skulls belonged to relatives of the second man. The fourth skull dated back between the 8th and 10th centuries and was originally buried in a nearby monastic cemetery, leading researchers to believe that it belonged to a Pictish monk. They think that the skull was a prized family heirloom. But at that time, the practice of placing disembodied skulls into a grave with a body was practically unheard of in Scotland, according to the site's lead archaeologist Cecily Spall, who spoke with Life Science. You can find examples in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age where body parts were used for worship, but this is something completely different, she explained. In the medieval period, harvesting the graves of your parents and grandparents for body parts and putting them into a contemporary burial is about as unusual as it gets. Evidence shows that the grave's original occupant died from extreme violence, most likely a fatal blow to the face. He was a man of high importance, perhaps a local leader, based on the location of his burial in the middle of a parish. The second man's relatives likely put him there to emphasize their connections with the first man, perhaps during a time of turmoil, when it would prove beneficial in legitimizing their community leadership. The San Xing Dui during the Bronze Age, a little-known culture called the Sangxuing Dui thrived in what is now China's Sichuan province. The only known site connected to the civilization turned up dozens of artifacts dating back to the 12th and 11th centuries BC, although evidence shows that a walled city existed at the site as far back as 1600 BC. Built along the banks of the Yazi River, the city and its walls were surrounded by large canals measuring between 66 and 82 feet wide and 6.6 .6 to 10 feet deep, which were used for navigation, defense, and flood control. Sangxuing Dui was divided into residential, industrial, and religious districts. A farmer discovered the first known evidence of the ancient culture in 1929 when he unearthed a cache of jade artifacts while digging a well. Many of the objects, therefore, ended up in the possession of private collectors. Meanwhile, Chinese archaeologists scoured the area for further evidence of the civilization and finally hit the painter in 1986, when they found sacrificial pits filled with bronze, jade, and pottery items. The items were broken and burned before being buried, indicating that they were ritually placed in the ground sometime between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago, when the culture mysteriously vanished from the site. Nobody really knows exactly who the Sangxuing Dui really were, despite the handful of evidence they left behind. 
They abandoned their settlements sometime between 2,800 and 3,000 years ago and possibly moved to the nearby ancient city of Jingsha. Researchers aren't sure why they fled. One prevailing theory suggests that the ancient people encountered an earthquake or a landslide, which redirected the Minjiang River, cutting them off from their freshwater supply and forcing them to relocate elsewhere. COVID-19 in Africa As the ongoing global coronavirus pandemic grips the planet, having infected over 26 million people worldwide so far, scientists were surprised when the African continent was not the most heavily affected as they had expected. Out of nearly 631,000 total COVID-19 cases in South Africa as of last September, 15,000 people had died from the disease. While Africa certainly is not exempt from the deadly virus, its caseload has remained relatively low, despite the prediction that the coronavirus would spread more easily in heavily impoverished areas. After all, this was certainly the case in Brazil and India, where COVID-19 spread like wildfire once it hit densely populated poor neighborhoods. Yet the countries of Africa fared much better when it came to both caseloads and death rates. So why? There are likely numerous factors at play, but scientists do not know for sure. Salim Abdul Karim, head of South Africa's COVID-19 response team, told the BBC that most African countries don't have a peak. I don't understand why. I'm completely at sea. One possibility is that Africa's population, which is much younger on average than the populations in the hardest hit countries, was better able to resist and overcome the virus. Another theory suggests that exposure to other human coronaviruses that cause common colds may have elicited an immune response in some people. I can't think of anything else that would explain the numbers of completely asymptomatic people we're seeing. The numbers are completely unbelievable, Professor Shabir Mahdi told the BBC. Public cooperation with safety measures and quick government responses to the virus may also play a role in Africa's lower case numbers. But as these statistics show, COVID-19 is a very real problem in Africa, even as scientists are seeing fewer cases of it and a better immune response. Cardim warned that it is still possible for the virus to mutate and spread like crazy throughout the continent. Casket on the Shore While walking along the shore at Bridge of Dawn near Aberdeen, Scotland in early 2019, a family spotted an eroding casket containing a woman's skeletal remains. Authorities summoned experts to the scene, where they determined that the woman was deliberately buried at the site, but not recently, probably sometime between the 17th and early 19th centuries. Aberdeenshire Council archaeologist Bruce Mann explained that the team originally thought the individual was a shipwreck victim, but they were surprised to learn that she was female. There is definitely a story there, but we may never know why she was buried here, he said. The team found no settlements and no other graves near the burial site. As far as they know, the burial is isolated. Once the investigation is finished, the woman will be reburied at a cemetery in Aberdeen. The Etruscans The Etruscans left behind the first identifiable evidence of their civilization around 900 BC in what is now Tuscany in modern-day Italy, a region once called Eritrea. They are considered one of the most advanced societies to develop outside of ancient Greece, yet scientists know very little about their origins. The earliest known examples of Etruscan writing date back to around 700 BC. Today's scholars only partially understand the Etruscan language, as the culture's texts did not survive into modern times. For this reason, researchers rely heavily on later writings from Greek and Roman sources, which carry a disapproving bias against the Etruscans and do not necessarily reflect the culture accurately. For example, archaeological evidence suggests that they were indigenous to Eritrea, but the Greeks wrote that the Etruscans stemmed from the indigenous Pelasgian population of Greece, something which modern experts doubt heavily. Etruscologist Dominique Briquel argued that the Greeks made this assertion based on witnessing trade between the Etruscans and Pelasgians and similarities between some of the two societies' traditions that likely resulted from cultural exchange rather than migration. Additionally, Brickell claimed that the Greeks had political motivations for fabricating the Etruscans' history. The Etruscans began assimilating into Roman society sometime during the 4th century BC, following the Roman-Etruscan Wars. In 90 BC, they were granted Roman citizenship, and their territory was fully incorporated into the Roman Empire in 27 BC. Much of the Etruscan culture was likely lost throughout this transition and even DNA studies have failed to definitely determine exactly where the civilization came from. Evasive Black Hole Scientists believe that a supermassive black hole sits at the center of every galaxy. A black hole in the Milky Way has the mass of 4 million suns, for example, 
and M87's black hole measures 2.4 billion solar masses. Based on the mass of the galaxy at the center of the Abel 2261 cluster, researchers expected it to have a central black hole weighing as much as 3 to 10 billion suns. Yet they've never detected it, despite searching numerous times. Between 1999 and 2004, researchers used data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory to look for X-rays streaming from the middle of the galaxy. The presence of X-rays is a good indicator of the possible presence of a black hole. As materials fall into the void, they accelerate and heat up, spewing intense X-ray light. The team found nothing. A more thorough recent study also proved fruitless, even after searching not just in the galaxy's center, but elsewhere. Scientists acted on the theory that two supermassive black holes may have collided and formed a recoiling black hole, and that the gravitational waves were asymmetrical, sending the object off course. But researchers have never seen one of these objects. They exist purely in theory, and they did not find one when they searched the Abel 2261 cluster but are hoping to glean some answers following the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope this October. Strange Viking Duo In late 2019, archaeologists dug up two Viking corpses buried with their longboats, one on top of the other, in central Norway. The pair died nearly a year apart, with the first burial, a man, dating back to the 8th century, and the second burial, a woman, dating back to the 9th century. This was likely done on purpose, according to scientists who believe that Vikings probably exhumed the man and his 33-foot-long longboat and placed the woman and her smaller longboat inside. I had heard about several boat graves being buried in one burial mound, but never about a boat that had been buried in another boat, said lead archaeologist Raymond Salvage. He learned, following the discovery, that several similar graves were found during the 1950s in southern Norway, but he said this is essentially an unknown phenomenon. Grave goods show that the 9th century woman who was buried in a 26-foot-long ship was an important person. She wore a pearl necklace and fine clothes and was laid to rest next to a cow's head. The most perplexing item in her grave was a cross-shaped brooch made in Ireland, leading researchers to believe that she was involved in Viking raids. Most of both boats' wood and human remains had rotted away, but scientists hope to learn more about the woman by analyzing her skull fragments and hopefully extracting DNA. The Bell Beaker Culture The Bell Beaker Culture arose around 2800 BC and is named for its inverted bell-shaped drinking vessels, which came into use at the very beginning of the European Bronze Age. These unique-looking cups became all the rage across Europe at the time, leading to a debate among modern experts. Whether the people who used the bell beakers were a single culture that migrated across Europe, or the vessels were used across various cultures. It's the pot versus people argument, which is one of the longest running questions in archaeology. The sheer variety of bell beaker artifacts makes it difficult to trace them to one singular culture or place of origin, leaving today's researchers to refer to the spread of these items simply as the bell beaker phenomenon. Scientists analyzed the genomes of 170 ancient Europeans and compared them to the genomes of other ancient people, as well as modern genomes. They found that skeletons discovered near bell beaker artifacts in modern-day Central Europe and Iberia shared few genetic ties, indicating that the culture did not consist of one group of migrating people. On the other hand, ancient remains from Britain point toward the bell beaker people being a genetically distinct group that almost entirely replaced the people who occupied the island before they arrived. This suggests that the beaker people invaded Britain and pushed out the previous population of Neolithic farmers, the ones who built Stonehenge. Today, British people have more DNA from the Beaker people than Neolithic farmers and are barely related to the Neolithic people who built the monument 5,000 years ago. The findings are absolutely sort of mind-blowing, said archaeologist Barry Cunliffe, a professor emeritus at the University of Oxford. They are going to upset people, but that's part of the excitement of it. DNA analysis of 400 prehistoric skeletons, some from after Stonehenge and others born before it was created, demonstrate that the beakers replaced 90% of the people and had fair skin and lighter hair and eyes. They may have destroyed the people who built Stonehenge by bringing the bubonic plague with them to Britain. The spread of ideas and migration and the fact that so many beaker artifacts have been found throughout Europe make these people an enigma. Neanderthal speech One big question scientists have is how did people sound in the past? And how did we develop speech? Scientists do not all agree on how our cousins, the Neanderthals, communicated with one another, or whether they were capable of verbal speech. 
There is only one preserved Neanderthal hyoid bone, which for humans helps us swallow, speak, and take in air. But with only one of these bones available for examination, it's difficult for scientists to determine whether speech was even possible for Neanderthals. One group of experts used computer modeling to reconstruct a Neanderthal skull, including where they think the hyoid bone sat. They also reconstructed what the hominid's voice box looked like and determined that Neanderthals were probably able to use their mouths, tongues, and throats similarly to how modern humans do. Because Neanderthals had differently shaped skulls than we do, their noises would have sounded different from ours. Writing for Gizmodo, researcher and anthropologist Anna Goldfield speculated that the Neanderthals' vowels, especially, would probably sound peculiar to us. She further explained that while it sounds possible for Neanderthals to communicate, evidence more strongly suggests that they did not. On the other hand, Stephen C. Levinson, director emeritus of the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, wrote that it's unlikely that Neanderthals performed a variety of other tasks we know they were capable of, including using symbolic media and advanced technology without being capable of speech. He said they possessed the right genes and anatomy for being able to communicate verbally. What do you think? Did language emerge among us, modern humans, as an exclusive trait that no other species possessed? Or is it possible that our distant cousins, the Neanderthals, were also capable of developing speech? As of now, we are still waiting for an explanation. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to learn about more fascinating topics that scientists can't yet explain, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time! Bye!